Simon, thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation, for this opportunity. Um, I'm very excited to be here tonight and, and to engage with your audience in this way. Um, we've certainly done a couple of these over the years. And uh, when you find the topic of tonight's uh, Power Hour may be a little bit intriguing, I guess it's a sign of my own age. You know, we look at our investments and we often talk about what are my investment objectives and so on. And it's usually about what am I trying to achieve in terms of the investment portfolio, the growth, the exposure, et cetera, et cetera. But ultimately, if you think about it, the main reason why we do investments is because we actually want to get something out of it, ultimately. So tonight's presentation is going to be in large part about that, almost that ultimate end goal. When I've now built up my portfolio over all this time and I'm in, in, in the feasting phase, I now want to start living off my investments. How do I do this? How do I get there? And so on. So um, I think in terms of that, I'm just going to get us started. Always have to do the disclaimer, a bit of detail about myself. But yes, tonight we want to talk about income as the outcome of my investment. And I'm going to do it in, in, in a few parts. The first one is really just maybe looking at some of the technical definitions in terms of what is income when we talk about investments and also what is yield, because these are terms that are often used a little bit interchangeably. Um, and then very much about when we are building up our wealth, when we're in the accumulation phase, how and when do I reinvest in the income that I get? Because I think often that is our focus and certainly the message that the likes of, of Warren Buffett certainly has promoted this idea of the power of compounding. How do I make that work for me? But ultimately, I think the, the, the aim of tonight is to talk about why and, and how would one then start drawing an income from your investments, really enjoying the fruits of your, of your labor. So let's start off with the types of income that we can get in an investment portfolio. Interest is one form of income that we can get, and interest can come in from different sources. Probably the one that many of us start out in life is just an ordinary bank savings product, or I'm, I'm just going to get some, some a savings account um, and, and, and earn some interest in that, or maybe a money market account, or even a money market unit trust, where all I'm earning in terms of that, that investment is interest. But as we progress, we also then start learning about things like bonds or um, sovereign debt, you know, so um, government bonds, for example, um, and I think nowadays a lot of people are familiar also with the concept of retail savings bonds. These are still interest bearing investments, but they do come with a couple of other aspects as well. We're going to talk about that. But so any, any form of debt where there is an interest payable on, on, the, on the money that you sort of put down falls into this category. We also have income from property investments, specifically when they are REITs, real estate investment trusts. So things like listed property companies or REIT ETFs, for example, many um, or much of the income that you would receive from such property investments also is paid in the form of interest rather than dividends. And what's really important to understand about interest is that interest is actually taxed as personal income. So when you look at the tax implications of earning interest in an investment, it could be anything from no, zero, zero um, tax that you've got to pay, but it could go as high as 45% if you are in the top marginal tax bracket in terms of your income. So when we consider the desirability of interest income in a portfolio, we've got to take very careful note of where am I in terms of the personal investment uh, income scope? Where am I in terms of my marginal tax bracket? Because the impact in terms of the amount of tax that I'm going to pay, in other words, the after tax amount of interest that I'm going to get could be significantly less than that nominal interest rate that you think you are earning on your investment. The other major form of income in an investment portfolio is dividends. Now, dividends really is you as an investor sharing in some way in the income that the company generates. So the company will generally declare their earnings, their earnings after tax and depreciation and all of those sort of things. And then a proportion of that, that net revenue, the company then may pay out in the form of dividends. And this is really just you as the investor sharing in some of those dividends. We also have preference shares, which is quite an interesting, I almost want to call it a hybrid of dividends and interest, because the amount of dividends that you get from a preference share is actually linked to interest rates. But the money that is paid out to you as the investor 
is actually dividends. So when it comes to the tax implication of dividends, if this, this income that is paid from preference shares, which is considered um, income, it's linked to interest rates, is paid as dividends. And when we're looking at the tax implications of dividends, very different from that as personal income, dividends are actually taxed at a flat rate of 20% we have a dividend withholding tax regime in South Africa, which really means that dividend tax is withheld at the source. In other words, if the company or your investment declares 100 Rand worth of dividends, you will only ever see 80 Rand of those dividends. The other 20 Rand gets automatically paid across to SARS, and that's it. Um, yes, there are some investment vehicles, such as tax-free investment accounts or retirement annuities and so on, where, um, where that is not the, the, the implication, but normally in a, an ordinary discretionary investment portfolio, dividends will be taxed at 20% as a flat rate. Now, how certain is this amount of income that you earn? Because that obviously is something else that might be very important to us. If I'm going to be looking at income into my investment portfolio, how sure can I be of the amount that I will get? So I'm going to differentiate between the certainty aspect around interest and dividends and differentiate between where I've got a fixed known amount of interest or dividends that I will receive, or maybe limited variability, versus those that have got high variability to them. So let's start with the fixed side and fixed interest in particular, because that's probably the easiest place to start. If I was to have a fixed deposit with a bank, for example, I'm quoted an interest rate and that interest rate is fixed for the duration of my investment, whether that is a one day rate or whether it's a three month or a five year rate, for example, my interest rate is fixed for that period of time. We also have many of our bonds, in particular most of our government bonds in South Africa also pay fixed coupon rates. Now just a little anecdote about why this thing is called a coupon. In the old days, long before there was any electronic sort of register of ownership of things, a bond that you bought literally was a piece of paper and they had these little bits sitting at the bottom end known as coupons and just like as in the old days you would have a little coupon that you could tear off something. In the case of your bond investment, you would tear off the little coupon usually twice a year, hand that in and actually get your, your interest payment in return. And even though we are way beyond the point of physical pieces of paper and coupons being torn off a, a bond piece of paper, the term has remained, but it really talks about the regular interest that you would be receiving on that amount of money that you effectively lent to government or whatever it is who's issued the bond. Important thing there, the level of the interest rate, the amount of interest is fixed and you therefore know with exact certainty how much interest you will be receiving from those. There are certain interest-based, interest-bearing investments, however, where that interest rate is variable. Probably the easiest one to think of is um, in a savings account with a bank or in a money market fund, for example, where as the Reserve Bank changes the prime rate, the overdraft rate, the repo rate, as it's often also called, so the level or the amount of interest that you would be receiving also varies with it. So obviously, if you are earning interest, that rate goes higher, great, you're getting more interest, but if it falls, like we saw early in 2020 at the advent of COVID, if that variable rate drops sharply, then your interest income also varies quite considerably. We do also have some bonds where there's also a variable interest rate and something might be linked to the prevailing level of interest rate, but um, in South Africa that's more the exception than the rule, but just so that you know that there are such variable rule, um, uh, coupon rates as well. What about dividends? We don't really have anything where dividends is a guarantee or a fixed dividend that you would be getting. Probably the closest we get to that is within preference shares because they are linked to the level of interest rates. And preference shares also by their very name talks about the fact that preference shareholders will be paid dividends before ordinary shareholders are paid dividends. So although there is still some variability or some um, you know, uncertainty certainty in terms of the amount of dividends that you would get from preference shares, it is a lot more certain than your ordinary dividend payments would be. And so I put it into this comment of, or this column of not quite fixed, but certainly more limited variability. 
We also have certain types of shares where the dividends that they pay out is actually quite regular. And they often refer to, in according to this term, dividend growers. And um, some of you might be familiar with the dividend aristocrats methodology. It's a methodology that s and Dow Jones indices use. And core shares has got two versions of these, both for South African equities as well as, um, as, as global equities. These dividend aristocrats uh, crat shares, where they're looking at companies that have consistently increased dividends over an extended period of time. So again, although it is not a fixed dividend that you're getting, at least you're knowing that you're invested in something, I think the term that's often used is cash cow, something that where the company is mature enough that they generate sufficient regular free cash flow that they are able to always year after year pay good dividends and growing dividends to their investors. For the most part, however, dividends can be quite variable and even unpredictable. We even have the extreme category of special dividends, where a company that might find themselves in a particular windfall position, we sometimes see that within commodity companies where they're making excessive amounts of profits, and rather than affect their sort of regular dividend policy, they would pay this out as a special dividend to clients. So dividends can be highly variable. Sometimes you can get incredibly attractive levels of dividends. I prob think probably that the most prominent for many people at the moment is the massive dividend that Tungela Resources paid out also, as so just declared. Um, but it's important to understand also that dividends can be highly variable. And again, I think this was a very hard lesson that many investors who rely on dividend income in their investment portfolios, they learned this the hard way during 2020, when many companies who normally pay out very good, very consistent dividends, suddenly because of the impact of COVID and because of the impact of protecting their balance sheets and the amount of cash that they had available, suddenly either stopped paying dividends or reduced dividend payments significantly. So it's important to understand that dividends is something which is not guaranteed. It's great when it comes, but there might be times that you don't get the dividends that you were hoping to receive. So what is the contribution of this income component to the total return of my investment portfolio? So when we talk about the total return of investment, it's the combination of the the capital gain or the price change that we see in our portfolio, plus whatever the income component is, irrespective of whether that income comes from interest or dividends. And when we look at the proportional contribution that these two components, the price change and the income make to the total return, it gives us some sort of sense of how, how what is the predictability, or I like to think of the stability of the total return that I can expect. Because you can appreciate that the higher the income, the more predictable or the more stable it would be compared to if most of the return is coming from price change or capital gain. Because certainly a very big capital gain, if the price of the share goes up significantly, it can give you a very high total return. And so certainly in, in, in high growth sectors and, and sectors where the companies are also going back and reinvesting a lot of the income that they get back into the business to grow it, this is an area where one would expect that you would have a relatively small amount of income coming in the, forms of, uh, in the form of dividends and quite significant price changes over time when prices go up. But of course, the converse is also true. When you have a capital loss, when prices fall, that can actually have a very severe negative impact on the total return. It could even result in a negative total return. But of course, if within that context, your investment also had a fairly substantial income component to it, it will cushion to some extent, extent the impact of that big capital loss, that big negative price change that you had. So the, the contribution or the proportion of income that you receive in an investment definitely is a major consideration in terms of, let's call it the riskiness or the variability of the total return that you can expect from such an investment. Let's just talk a little bit about the term yield. What is yield in terms of such income that we were speaking about? So 
yield, I guess one can say, is really it's expressing that income that you receive, whether it's interest or dividends, but expressing that income as a percentage of the price that you pay. So whether it's interest yield or dividend yield, it's really the interest or the dividend divided by the price, and that is the yield. Now, if the price goes up, you can see from that formula that because price is the denominator, it's below the line. If the price increases, it means the yield will go down and vice versa. So let's look at an example. If you were to receive 10 Rand dividends on an investment of 100 Rand, it means your dividend yield is 10%, 10 divided by 100. If the price increases to 110 Rand, the yield drops to 9.1%. Why? Because your denominator, the bit that sits below the line, is now a bigger amount and therefore the yield is lower. Conversely, if the price drops to 90%, the yield increases to 11.1%. And this should start to give you some sort of um, insight almost maybe in terms of um, where we often talk about the inverse relationship between price and yield. Note I talk about yield. I'm not talking about interest rate or even dividends, but rather just the yield. What am I actually getting from this investment? So let's talk a little bit about the yields on fixed rate government bonds, because I often see for many investors that this is something that really challenges their thinking in terms of what to think of in terms of their investments. So remember I said that the coupon that you're getting on a government bond is a fixed interest rate. And that level of fixation, that fixed rate, is something that remains constant throughout the lifetime of the bond. So irrespective of how the price of the bond changes over time, that amount of interest that you will be receiving stays constant. The interest yield that you will get from your investment is effectively locked in at the time of your purchase. So let's assume that I'm making just a single investment. I'm buying a single government bond at one point in time and I'm holding it on uh, until maturity. The yield that I achieved effectively at outset is based on that fixed interest rate, which doesn't change, and the price that I paid which also doesn't change based on what I paid for it. And therefore, that interest yield that I'm getting from my investment is locked in if I hold that bond until maturity. The price at which you trade that bond, if you were to trade it, or maybe even a basket of bonds or a bond ETF, for example, that price at which it trades changes and varies over time. So going back to our makeup of total return, you can now appreciate that that price, that valuation at which it trades going up and down could represent a capital gain or a capital loss. But the interest, the interest component is fixed, your interest yield is fixed. And I think investors often find it very difficult when they look at the, uh, at the returns of government bonds, which bear in mind is based on almost the day to day, the market value valuation or the price of that bond ETF and say, oh, but I made a big loss or I made a big profit or whatever the case might be. That's just the price component. The interest yield, the amount of interest that you receive is so absolutely fixed. So what about retail savings bonds? or fixed deposits, very attractive to people who have got very low risk tolerance or who is very dependent on that interest. So the, it's great that you know that there is a fixed um, interest that you're going to be getting. But the other thing about retail savings bonds and about fixed deposits that you do, effectively, the price also remains fixed. Because a retail savings bond, bond doesn't trade in the secondary market, so there's no day-to-day -day pricing that goes up and down. And think of your fixed deposit in the bank, that 100 Rand that you put in just remains the 100 Rand. It doesn't get more or less, it is just the 100 Rand. The capital of it remains unchanged. So this is where some of the concerns come in when we look, look at the fixed term and how long that term is, which is typically applicable to both retail savings bonds as well as to fixed deposits. Because the price of that bond or that fixed deposit cannot change, the longer the term of that investment, the bigger the potential impact of inflation is on that investment that you make. Because let's think about it. If I have a five-year fixed um, a deposit or a five-year retail savings bond. 
if inflation was just 5% per annum, and we know we're currently sitting way be beyond that, but let's work on 5% per annum. After five years, that 100 rand that I put into my investment reduces to a purchasing power or effective value of just 78 rand. So now you've got to ask yourself, was the, the interest that I received sufficient to compensate me for the fact that what I can do with the capital when I get it back, my 100 rand when I get it back, it can now only purchase the equivalent of what I could buy for 78 rand at the outset of my investment. An even bigger problem comes in if the interest payment on these fixed deposits or retail savings bond is of such a way that it's only paid as a lump sum at the end of the term. And I often see investors being very attracted to this because often you see that that's got a higher quoted interest rate when you've got this lump sum only paid at the end of the term. Because bear in mind, whoever you gave your money to has got the use of that interest right until the end, until the five years open. So they're very happy to give you a slightly higher rate. But the problem that you have is because interest is taxable, it means that that amount of interest that you're going to receive at a lump sum at the end means in this example of five years, you are going to get five years worth of interest in a, as a lump sum in a single tax year, which means the taxable income in that one year is basically amplified to the five year income that you're receiving. And the example that I'm giving there, you know, retail savings bonds, the five year retail savings bond at the moment sitting at 11% annum per annum. If you invest it in the format that you only get it as a lump sum payment at the end of the year, it's 550,000 Rand that will be added to your taxable income. If that is the only income that you have, that will put you in a 36% tax bracket, which effectively means that after tax, you did not receive 11% interest, you actually only received 7%. So be very careful in terms of how to think about the tax implications, the after-tax income, the term, what can compensate you for capital growth or not when you consider these interest-based investments. Let's then talk about reinvesting the income because now we are listening to Warren Buffett and, and we're listening to, to the, the power of compounding and in particular we're actually listening to this guy called Einstein who said compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. He who understands it earns it and he who doesn't pays it. So we've really bought into this idea that you always want to reinvest any income that you get whether it's interest or whether it's dividends because it's in that compounding effect where you really see the power of how your money starts working for you. And I've just done a little graph there of 100 Rand, a one sort 100 Rand investment. If I compound it at 10% per annum for a period of 40 years, it's 4,526. And you can see from the slope of that graph how in the early years, it doesn't really feel as though that compounding is doing all that much for you. But as the interest on interest and the growth on growth compounds and accelerates through time, you see the extent to which the slope on, on that graph really just accelerates forward. So yes, we absolutely, when we are in our wealth accumulation phase, when we're still building up our assets, we definitely want to be reinvesting all the income and the dividends that we receive. So how do we do it? What is the best way to do it? Well, the first prize is actually if it's just done for you. So if you are invested in a total return fund or an accumulation fund, these are terms that are often used, that's first price because whatever income, whether it's interest or dividends, that's received within the investment fund is automatically just reinvested for you. You don't have to do anything. It doesn't cost you to do anything. It's all done for you. And by the way, that is the way that most of our unit trusts, for example, work. And we've got many ETFs that are also total return ETFs. Great, they do it automatically for you. Second prize would be is if you are holding that investment on a platform or within an environment where they offer the opportunity for you to automatically reinvest it for you. And typically what is done here is it gets reinvested back into whatever the source of the income is. So let's say, for example, I've got a portfolio of five different ETFs and three of them pay out dividends or interest and the other two don't. Whatever income I receive from a particular ETF will then automatically be reinvested for me into the ETF from which I got that interest or dividend income. 
Now, the, 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 the one thing, it's great. It does, it does it automatically for you. You don't have to think about doing it. It's wonderful. But remember, there is the cost involved of reinvesting that. So that's, so that's why the first prize is where the accumulation actually happens inside the fund for you. But that doesn't mean that manual reinvestment, where you've actually got to do it yourself, is necessarily always a bad thing. Some of the benefits from manual reinvestment is that mostly you find that investments obviously have some sort of fee structure, some cost structure to it. And somehow you've got to pay for those. So if all of your investments are in total return or accumulation funds, the only way that your investment service provider can actually get their fees that they need to do is they've actually got to sell some of your investments. They've got to sell some of your units in order to pay for your fees or your costs. The other aspect of it also is that you don't necessarily have to invest that income separately, reinvest it and incur costs on just that. But if you're making regular contributions to the investment, you know what, it's just like a little top up to your, your regular monthly contributions that you're making and you could just reinvest it along with that. And therefore the cost of that reinvestment really becomes negligible. But the other one that can be very useful is when you receive such income coming into your portfolio, it gives you the opportunity maybe to somewhat rebalance or reposition the portfolio without you necessarily having to actively sell down some investments and redeploy the money somewhere else. So manual reinvestment is not all bad and it can certainly be useful and why I quite like having a combination of total return ETFs and distributing ETFs in one portfolio to give me some of these benefits. So why are we really doing this? Why are we accumulating wealth? Because, well, we've got some sort of goal. We want to get to the top of Mount Everest. Now, I've never been there, um, and I've, uh, I've climbed a couple of mountains, but certainly nothing as high as Everest. And I guess the question really is, how do you know when you're there? So I guess if you're on Everest, you can probably, if it's not too cloudy, you can look around and say, well, there ain't anything higher than this, so I must be there. But I think there are many other types of mountains that one can climb, or certainly within investments, we, you might not be quite sure whether you're there yet. So when do you know that you're there? Is it when you reach the retirement date, some magic number called 60 or 65 or whatever? Do you now suddenly just magically reach the point of, okay, I've now reached my goal in terms of my investments, and now I've reached my goal? Well, maybe you have, or maybe you haven't. I think what's more important is to be able to understand I have enough. <laughs> so you say, how much is enough? And this is a very important question. And the lovely answer to that is it depends. Of course, it depends on how much do you need? And I like the definition of, of, of the what is enough to really say to have an asset pool that is big enough to meet my income needs in a sustainable way. So clearly, the more your income, the higher your income needs, the bigger the asset pool you're going to, to need. The more modest your income needs, the smaller the asset pool that, that would be sufficient. So very important for us to understand how much is enough. So how can I calculate? Let's do a couple of rough calculations to, to help us sort of just get some sort of ballpark figure of when will I have enough. And I don't want to get bogged down into an inflation adjustment, sort of bear in mind that what I'm showing you here incorporates inflation already. So I'm not going to go into that as a separate um, one. But there's two different ways from which we can approach it. You can either start with what is the size of the asset pool that I already have? What can that give me? And so the asset pool, I'm specifically here talking about income producing assets. So assets that can actually provide you some sort of income. And I'm going to restrict the focus of tonight's discussion to retirement savings and discretionary investments. There are others as well, but for the purposes of what we want to discuss here tonight, I'm going to restrict my comments to these two components. So I can then add up the total size of my asset pool. And what I can then do is calculate what is a sustainable monthly income, the SMI, that I can achieve from that asset pool? And the other important component in this equation is the SDR, the sustainable drawdown rate. And I'll come back to what is a sustainable drawdown rate, but I've just used an example there of 4%. So if I have an asset pool of 3 million rand, 
at a 4% drawdown rate per annum, that can give me 10,000 Rand per month on a sustainable basis. So this is a great starting point for you to go and say, what do I already have? And here where I am now, and I don't care whether you're 35 or 85 years old, to say, based on what I have, what sustainable monthly income can that give me? And maybe you'll find that, oh, that's already good enough for me. I already have enough, even though I'm just 35. Or maybe you realize, no, I actually need more. So the other way to do it is to say, well, what do I need? What is my monthly income requirement that I need, specifically coming from these income producing assets? So my monthly income requirements, I can do my budget, I can do my calculation and say, this is the amount of money I need on a monthly basis. And now I can say my asset pool that I require would now be that monthly income requirement multiplied by 12 for 12 months, divided by the sustainable drawdown rate. And again, using a 4% as a, as a drawdown rate, I can then calculate that if my monthly income requirement is 25,000 Rand, it means I'm going to need an asset pool of 7.5 million Rand in order to sustain. So these are the ballpark figures. These are some basic rough calculations that at least can give you some sort of spectrum of where am I and how does this work. But the sustainable drawdown rate, what is sustainable? We often hear this number four or maybe five percent sort of being bandied about. Now, the FECA, the Financial Sector Conduct Authority, um, not too long ago issued a conduct standard on the conditions for living annuities. And they provided this table really to give guidance in terms of what do they recommend to be a sustainable drawdown rate depending on a particular age. And this has got to do with life expectancy and so on if they do this. And they also alongside that tell you what do they believe is the maximum drawdown rate that one should look at. Effectively saying to you, listen, rather stick with a recommended drawdown rate, that is fully sustainable. But if you are going to the maximum drawdown rate, do appreciate that there will probably not be much capital left of your assets at the end of your lifetime. So this might also start talking to, do I actually want to leave a financial legacy or a, a monetary legacy to my beneficiaries, to my kids, to my inheritance, or am I going to basically use up all my money in, in the remaining lifetime that we've got? So there's a table for you that you can use as a basic starting point in terms of understanding what is considered a sustainable drawdown rate. A couple of important notes that I want to highlight here. When I quoted those monthly income numbers, I've got to remember the tax implication because I am now assuming that what I'm getting on a monthly basis is already after tax. So certainly when I talk about my monthly income requirements, that must be after tax. Or when I talk about what amount of money can I expect from my investments, bear in mind that there would be tax implications. So always keep tax in mind. The other very important factor is the factor of costs, because the costs of the type of investments that you've got, you can almost effectively think of that as an additional drawdown rate, because that's not money that is drawn and paid to you, but it's still money that come out of your investment and is just paid to the investment services provider. So if you've got a 4% drawdown rate, but the cost of that investment product is 2%, effectively you are sitting at a six percent drawdown rate so the costs are very very important and obviously the lower we can keep the costs the more sustainable we can effectively make that drawdown rate that we've got what about inflation i said i'm not going to go into the detail of the actual levels of inflation because with a lot of these calculations and projections we incorporate the impact of inflation but that's typically done at the headline inflation level and I think most of us know that our personal inflation rate is often quite different than that headline inflation rate. And certainly as you get older, you might very well find that there are certain aspects of your personal inflation rate, which is a lot higher than the headline inflation rate, in particular things like medical inflation. There might be other aspects of inflation. Maybe you drive less, so the, the, or the, the impact in terms of, of transport inflation is less in your life. But Get a good understanding of what is your personal inflation rate when you do these sort of assessments planning calculations. So let's now get to the point where we can design a tax efficient drawdown strategy for our investments. I've now reached my goal, I'm at the top of Mount Everest and I'm now ready to put on those skis and start 
effortlessly sliding down the mountain. The first thing I want to bring to your attention is that we should look at a strategy where we can build up the monthly income that we need from different sources. We are long past the age where you work for 40 or 45 years for the same company, retire from the company pension fund and earn a pension from that company for the rest of your life and die. Our lifestyle, our sources of income, our sources of, or even our expenses look quite different. So we wanna build up an income from different sources. I want to focus first and foremost on what tax-free income am I able to get? Listen, I always, whatever I can possibly do in terms of tax-free or saving taxes, as, as far as is legally possible, I want to make sure I get the maximum tax-free income I possibly can. So what interest can I earn tax-free? Well, if you are, so that, that's the one aspect is the, 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 the tax-free interest income, but then there's also the personal income and there is a personal income tax threshold. So those are the two important things we want to consider and say, I want to make sure that I maximize those tax-free or zero tax components that I've got in terms of my income. Once you've once you've sort of depleted or used up your full zero tax allowance, then it starts becoming a more of a balancing act. Because remember how I said that the differences between um, interest and dividends, and we're going to talk about capital gains shortly as well, the different levels of percentage tax that you've got to pay means that by balancing these between different sources of income and how that gets taxed can allow you to design a strategy that is as tax efficient as possible. So your personal income is one aspect where you can do that, but there's also dividend income. Remember personal income I said is between zero and 45%, dividends at a flat rate of 20%, and then there is capital also, which again can be something that a good source of income with no or little tax implications. We're going to go into some of the details of this shortly. So let's start with the tax-free income. How much income can I receive without having to pay tax? Well, on the interest side, there's the two, depends on your age in terms of this, is if you're under 65 years old, you qualify for 23,800 Rand per annum of interest that you don't pay tax on. And that translates into close to 2,000 Rand per month. That's a good start. That's not bad. If you've got enough money in interest bearing investments that can give you the 2000 Rand per month, that's a nice starter kit in terms of income that I received on which I paid no tax. If you're older than 65, it gets a little bit better, 35 and a half thousand, which translates to almost 2,900 Rand per month of tax-free interest income that you can receive. What about your personal tax? What is your tax threshold in terms of personal income? There we've got three categories. Less than 65 years or under 65 years old, your income tax threshold is 91,250 Rand, which translates to just over 7,600 Rand per month. So from this, you can see that if you are under 65 years old, there's a good nine and a half thousand rand of income that you can receive every month on which you don't have to pay any tax. Great start. Over 65 years, your tax um, income tax threshold is 141,000 or 11,700 a month. Over 75 years, it increases even further. And in this case, you can earn 13,158 rand per month without having to pay any tax on it. So we certainly want to make sure as far as possible that we maximize these two components. Now, what about taxable income? Once we've now depleted all the sources of zero tax income, what about taxable income? So on the personal income side, because we've got tax brackets, your marginal tax rates somewhere between 18 and 45 percent. On the previous slide, I showed you how much you can earn where you pay zero tax. And once you exceed those thresholds, now you start paying taxes and then these, it ranges from 18% up to the marginal tax rate of 45%. So the exact amount of income that you, that you earn will determine exactly what is the, the tax rate that you pay on your personal income. Now, typically what I try and look at here is that I would like to minimize the income on which I have to take, pay tax. And I like to sort of try and keep that income, if possible, 
to the point where I'm still below the 26% tax bracket. So, because you'll see that you jump from 18 to 26%, that's the very next tax bracket. So, if I can keep my personal income to round about 30,000 Rand per month, I am still sitting below that 26% tax bracket. And why the 26? Well, I would have loved a 20, but I to compare it to dividend withholdings tax, but that one's not available. So I'm trying to work with something here that is at least less than 26% tax. Now you might say to me, but that 30,000 Rand a month is not going to be enough for me in terms of my taxable income. And it means I now need to start supplementing my income that I get every month with income that I will receive from dividends and ultimately even income that I can get from capital gains. Dividends, as I said, flat rate of 20%. So we know it's a known tax rate. We know exactly what we're going to be paying there. And that's why you'll see I'm trying with my income to sort of keep it to a level that I would, I don't want to pay a lot more personal income tax than that, because I know I can earn dividends and not have to pay more than 20% tax on my dividends. Capital gains is a very interesting one because typically I find that people are very resistant to or very reluctant to pay capital gains tax. And the irony is that that's actually one of the lowest forms of tax that you can pay because the maximum, maximum rate that you can pay on capital gains is 18%, less than dividend withholding tax. And that is based on the 40% inclusion rate of, so 40% of all the capital gains that you make, it actually counts as taxable income. And the maximum rate that we've got there is our 45% marginal tax rate. So 40 times 45, and I've got an 18% maximum effective tax rate. So this is something that we really need to sort of get our minds around is to understand that once we've accumulated a significant amount of wealth, Capital gains is actually one of the best sources of tax efficient income that we can have in our investments. Think about a couple of general rules of thumb and why we really want to, um, to reduce our taxable income um, you know, as, 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 as much as possible and whatever makes tax sense sort of from that point of view. The other reason why we want to reduce our payments or our withdrawals from pensionable, um, from retirement savings and increase from discretionary is about the estate duty or the death taxes benefits that comes further down the line. Because at the time of your death, whatever assets you hold in annuities, whether those are retirement annuities or living annuities, those all fall outside of your estate. So this is quite important that you actually want to try and reduce the size of that discretionary portfolio sooner rather than later to avoid the death taxes or the estate duties that might potentially come later and rather keep your annuity as much as possible. So that's really a general rule of thumb. And for many people, that's quite counterintuitive because surely this pension, the retirement money that I built up, that must be my main source of income. But once you're gone, actually, this is a better way for you um, to, to, for, for your beneficiaries, for your, for your kids, for your inheritance, to actually have more money available in the annuity, which is protected from that. So estate sizes below three and a half million rand attracts no death um, taxes or no estate duties. So that's really sort of a, a ballpark, a rule of thumb, a, a type of figure that we want to try and aim for is to say, let me see if I can keep my discretionary investments to below three and a half million rand at the time of my death, because then at least there's no estate duties payable on that. So we're going to keep that in mind, because of course, there may be constraints. This sounds all good and well, but maybe, you know, it doesn't quite, we will always find that we've got a box sort of with, within the constraints or we've got a bowl within the sort of those, um, those uh, uh, sidebars that we've got. So you may be a member of a pension fund. So in terms of your retirement savings, your retirement money might be coming from a pension or a provident fund rather from your, from, than from a living annuity. And in the case of a pension or a provident fund, you might find that you've got relatively limited control over whatever that initial pension amount is. You will be retired and they'll tell you, you know, this is pretty much the monthly pension that you're going to get. This is the rate at which it will increase from year to year. And you don't really have much of a say over that. You also have got no control over the annual increases, whether that be good or bad. But ultimately, this is all taxable income in your hands. So you can see how that particular component or size of your overall asset base might constrain you quite specifically in terms of how to sort of limit the taxes that you pay. 
in the case of a living annuity, you are by law required to withdraw a minimum of two and a half percent per annum. Now, depending on the size of your um, of your living annuity, that could mean something really big in rand terms, or it can mean something really small in rand terms. It all depends. But in terms of rand terms, the amount that that is is going to determine what your personal income tax is on that. You might also be in a situation where part or all of your retirement savings is in a life annuity or a guaranteed annuity. Now, for the purposes of what we're doing here, I'm excluding such calculations from the asset pool because it is not an active income producing asset. What I rather do is I reduce my income requirements by a similar amount. In other words, when I look at my asset pool, I'm only looking at what income do I need to generate from the rest of my assets and what income do I require from that over and above the life or guaranteed annuity income that I've got. By the way, the same sort of principle applies to other sources of income, such as rental properties and so on. I'm excluding it from the asset pool, but I'm also reducing my income requirements with the income that I would receive from that. So trying to keep things relatively simple here. So what sort of investment strategy will now support my drawdown strategy? And Ideally, you really want to have a different investment strategy for each, and I'm going to call it pot, or this bucket of investments that you're looking on. And it will depend on, and remember, we're talking retirement savings and discretionary investments. So those are the two pots that I'm talking about. And so the investment strategy for each of this will, determine, will depend in part on what is the size of that pot, and what is the drawdown requirement that I've got from that pot, both, both in terms of a rand amount, but also in terms of a percentage. And the questions you need to ask yourself is, what of all of this is within your control? Am I in a pension fund or am I in a living annuity? So do I have control or not? And what are the implications of making changes to my investment strategy? Is it in a taxable environment? Is this going to cost me a lot of money or whatever? So those are the things you want to keep in mind. Because some of the components of the strategy will actually be almost given inputs into the process and others are within your control. And I make reference here to the term mind the gap. Some of you might have might have attended, it's literally about two years ago, the proactive passive management JC Power Hour that I did on the 20th of August, also with just one lap. So if you if you did see that, you might know what I'm talking about in terms of this. If you didn't see it, it's certainly worthwhile for you when it comes to the design of a portfolio um, a, a, a strategy that, that, that you make reference to that one. So in that particular one, I gave some broad guidelines on, on, on portfolio design. And for the purposes of what we're talking about here today, I'm going to divide this into three time horizon sort of components. Whatever money, income needs I have for the short term, and I've chosen to define short term as anything up to the first three years, my income requirements for that, I want to have that mostly in cash, interest bearing type of investments, where I've got very limited capital risk. I do not want to end up in a situation where I've got to get my monthly income and there's been a big drop in markets or there's a big capital loss that I'm experiencing. So my short-term needs, cash, interest bearing. I then turn my attention to the next sort of four years after that, the medium term, three to seven years, and I can now estimate what income would I need in that next period, the medium term, and there I'm really going to be looking at a portfolio strategy that is a diversified fund, a balanced fund, multi-asset type of portfolio strategy, good balance between income and capital growth and so on. The rest of my money, that whatever the projected income means is, and whatever is left over for the long time, more than seven years, 10 years, et cetera, et cetera. For that, I really need to have a very high risk capital growth seeking portfolio. I refer to it as a future fit investment strategy. And very important that for that part of your money, you need a portfolio that's going to outperform inflation. Otherwise, you're guaranteed to get poorer in real terms. So in that proactive passive management one, I showed you sort of a very basic initial portfolio design. I'm just bringing this up to remind those of you that might have seen it or those that haven't before, just how we did the structure in terms of this. Now I'm going to use that same structure and say, let's now design a portfolio for our income desire. Case study that I've got here for us. Got somebody who's got 10 million rand, he's got six and a half million in retirement savings, three and a half million in discretionary investments. He has a monthly income requirement of 30,000 rand. 
which means that his drawdown rate is 3.6% per annum. FSCA will be very happy, that's a very sustainable drawdown rate. Age 60, so definitely is sustainable at the age of 60. His short-term needs, the first four years, because it's year zero and one, two, and three, is 1.44 million rand. That's 30,000 rand a month times 12 times four years, 1.44 million. The medium term, same amount of money, because we're talking again about here, now I'm talking about years three to seven. And then the balance, whatever is left over, you can see I use the 10 million rand minus the two pots of money that I allocated for the short and the medium term leaves me with 7.12 million. So what sort of portfolio strategy do I want to have for the short, the medium and the long term? So coming back to the type of um, structure that we've used in the proactive passive management um, server and um, webinar, for the short term portfolio, I really, as I said, want to focus on low risk, mostly in, in um, interest bearing, cash, money market at most. My main focus here is capital protection. And so I've suggested there 50% exposure to cash, 720,000 in other words, another 25% to bonds, and another 25% to preference shares. So you can see mostly income producing, very little capital risk exposure. My medium term exposure, I said, well, there I'm interested in more sort of a balanced fund, a medium risk balanced fund. So you can see I'm spreading my assets now amongst equities as well. Bigger exposure to my home market than to developed markets, not too much in emerging markets, trying to keep the risk lead relatively low, starting to introduce some property investments, maybe some precious metals as well, but a 65% equity portfolio, which is really sort of a medium risk balanced fund exposure. My final portfolio, the long-term one, that remaining 7.12 million, is then going to go into a high-risk capital growth portfolio. Now you'll see I'm beyond cash, beyond bonds, beyond preference shares. I'm not going to use those in that portfolio. I'm going to have an overweight exposure to global markets because that's where the bigger growth in the longer term is expected to be. I'm prepared to take on more risk in terms of things like precious metals, in terms of property, and so on. And I can now aggregate, put these three individual buckets or portfolios together and come up with a target portfolio holding across my whole 10 million rand portfolio, which really is just the result of the bits that I put together from the short, the medium and the long term portfolio. So now I have a target sort of asset allocation and, and even category exposures that I'm looking for. The next step is that I now have to divide this up between my retirement savings and my discretionary portfolio. So what goes where? Let's start with the discretionary portfolio because the discretionary portfolio is the one where we want to try and do things in a tax efficient manner. So what I've done is I've looked at my tax-free income that I can get from interest. I've split that between cash and bonds. And then you'll see I'm using quite a bit in terms of things like preference shares um, still, and some allocation to precious metals, developed markets, and really whatever else remains I've put into my home market, my SA equity market. That's my three and a half million rand portfolio. The balance thing, my living annuity now has to be the balancing factor for all of this. So I go and look at the six and a half million, and I say, I know what I was supposed to have in SA equities overall, so whatever I don't have in my discretionary portfolio has got to be in my living annuity. And ultimately putting these two together, because remember, the living annuity is where there are no tax implications. So this is the one where you should have a higher risk profile because you can afford to have high capital gains in this one because you don't have to pay tax on it. So it's counterintuitive. We so often think in terms of our retirement savings, oh, that's got to be low risk. You know, can't take risk there. But the tax protective nature of the annuity structure says this is really the portfolio in which you want to take the higher risk. It's also the one where if I need to take have more interest bearing, I can do it there because there's no tax on the interest that I earn there. So I end up with a portfolio where my six and a half in the living annuity and the three and a half million in the discretionary is now allocated in a tax efficient manner across those different categories that I've got. Now, how do I then draw my regular income from that once I've now constructed that? You're going to start with the LA or the living annuity, and you're going to do the balance from the discretionary. So let's take our case study again. Now, I can see I've got to move on because I'm almost out of time. 
let's start with the minimum that I have to draw from the, the living annuity, which is two and a half percent. That's going to give me 13,541 before tax for the small tax payment that I've got to do. If the 13,223 is what I'm going to get after tax, it means the balance of my 30,000 Rand has got to come from discretionary, which is 16,777. And on a three and a half million Rand portfolio, that's a 5.8% drawdown. So this probably seems a little bit high relative to the two and a half that I'm going to take from the living annuity. So this is where my, my little juggling, my balancing act really comes in. So I said, okay, let me now try for that, that personal income tax bracket where I'm still sort of sitting at maximum 18% tax, no more than that. And if I do 18,000 Rand before tax from the living annuity, that's a 3.3% drawdown rate, comfortable with that. That's the amount that I'm going to get after tax, which means the 13,121 that I've got to draw from on a discretionary represents a 4.5% drawdown rate. And that for me is, that's doable. That's sustainable. And I'm able to probably generate the majority of that 13,121 rand from zero tax or low tax sources. Now you'll see what I'm showing you here is not an exact science. There's quite a bit of art involved in while there's a bit of juggling, but I'm hoping I can give you some ideas of how to think about this type of portfolio. Some practical considerations. Your living annuity or your pension fund is automatically going to be paid out to you by your provider. You'll be paid after tax. But whatever you take from your discretionary, you have to set up. So you've got to think very carefully. Can you do it as an automated payment? Do you have to, are you going to source this from cash holdings or from dividends or interest? Or you're going to have to sell units to do this? So there's some thinking around the operational or the practical aspects. And then there's always the tax considerations. Dividend withholding tax will already be prepaid. Any capital gains tax or tax on interest will be due in the following year. So bear in mind when you consider your cash flow requirements for the following year. What about funds that you save for a specific purpose? So that definitely should be in a low risk or an interest bearing investment. But the, the, how specific that requirement is really will determine how low risk you're talking about. If you require full capital guarantee, for example, a repayment of a loan, just keep that money in cash, even if there is a tax implication, because you've got to be certain that the capital amount will be there when you need it. If either the timing of that, of that specific purpose or the amount is somewhat bearable, you can consider sort of the capital certainty with the tax implication of the income earned. And you know what? If this is something that you're saving for a wish list, like a holiday, you can afford to be more flexible and thus higher risk. So the specific purpose really sort of depends on what that purpose is for. Your tax considerations, as before, bearing in mind what is what's income, what is capital, et cetera, et cetera. I'm rushing through here because I realize I'm out of time. Want to make an important point in terms of how do I measure the success of my strategy? Because appropriate performance measurement is so key to help us stay the course. We've got to be realistic about the expectations that we've got from our investments to help us keep the faith, not to lose. And for me, success is really defined as the investment is doing what it's supposed to do. It's not just about trying to generate a higher return. So the other area of caution is not to assess your performance as an overall total pool, not to look at my 10 million Rand in total and say, what was my overall performance, but to really look at it in your different buckets or your different components that you've got and that you measure your performance accordingly. Um, so for example, for me, the most important check whether I'm successful is that I stick to my plan. Um, you want to measure the performance of each pot or bucket relative to its, its sort of benchmark or what was required from it. And so some suggestions here is really in terms of your short term portfolio, compare it to what's available in terms of cash rates or money market rates. The medium term portfolio, have a look at the ASISA medium equity, medium risk balance fund performance. The average on that is a good benchmark. And in terms of the long term, I'm suggesting maybe a 30% SA equity, 70% global equity benchmark. Again, you can use ASISA categories or you can use the JSC All Share Index for the local equity and the All Country World Index for the global equity, of course, in RAND terms. Your annual review, revisit your income requirements. Consider your living annuity increases as an increase to the amount that you're receiving, not based on a fixed percentage. 
because as the performance of your living annuity, the value of it changes over time, a fixed percentage will either result in a much higher RAND amount at times when you don't really need it, or at a much lower amount. I can tell you people who had the annual review at the end of June this year, if you were to apply a fixed percentage, very significant significant negative impact. And the, the, the proof is there that if you increase um, by an inflation adjustment on the amount every year, as long as you started with a sustainable drawdown rate, it will remain sustainable over the, the period of time. Understand your personal inflation rate and consider what ad hoc cash flow requirements what you might have. Then you put all of these back into your target portfolio design. So you, you know, rinse and repeat, repeat that exercise, repeat the mind the gap exercise. Where am I? Where would I like to be? How do I change? Update your practicalities. Where's my drawdown coming from? Who's going to pay it to me? How do I do it? And you know what? Then please go off and enjoy your life. This is not, unless investments is your life, really, you want to do this once a year and then go off and enjoy your life. Final other considerations, there might be other sources of income, I mentioned some of those, other sources that covers expenses, things like insurance or loyalty programs or even opportunities to save costs, I'm not going to go into details there. When should you do all of this? And I say they're not just at what age, but at what stage. Rules of thumb, start accumulating wealth as soon as possible. Now, as you approach the peak, maybe 80% of the way to where you want to be, you really should start thinking about transitioning your portfolio to what you desire afterwards. I suggest the age of 50, if all else being equal, it's five years between before you turn 55, which is that magic age at which you can have access to your retirement funds and you can start doing something with it. You want to start planning for your desired position, what sits in retirement, what sits in discretionary investments, and make sure that you build up to having the right sizes, relevant, relative sizes of pools for that. And then you want to implement a gradual transition for what your portfolio looks like prior to this, to what it needs to look like at the time when you reach the peak. I really believe that the key to success lies in the design of the strategy and the sticking to the plan. If you follow that, you will be successful in your strategies. And I really believe that a good financial advisor or planner is critical unless you feel competent to do this yourself. And certainly there are many people that might be feel confident. And when I talk about a good financial advisor, I'm referring to the planning process and helping you stay the course. This is not about who can pick good investments for me. So beware a process where the financial planner or advisor only ever talks about the investment portfolios and the investment selections and the investment returns and never says anything about these crucial considerations about the sources of income, the tax implications of it, and how to best design that composite investment strategy. Very importantly, as far as I'm concerned, focus on what's within your control. And what's within your control is in the planning, sticking to the strategy and so on. Don't stress about what's not within your control, which is investment performance. The market will do what the market will do. We don't have control over it. So focus your energy there where you can actually make a difference and let the market do its thing and trust the process. And that will take you back to the key of the success that lies in the design of the strategy and sticking to the plan. And those are really my closing thoughts. And I'm terribly sorry that I've now used up all the time and so now there's no time for questions. But Simon, if you want to ask, um, sort of keep, extend the time, I'm available, I'm happy, I'm in your hands. Uh, Irina, that was excellent. We're always prepared to sit longer. We're never going to kick you off the stage. Um, <laughs> most of the questions I could manage with. They wanted to, so a lot of folks were asking if we're recording. Yes, recorded. Uh, it is at justonelap.com. It will be online in a couple of hours. The video which Nina referred to earlier, I dropped that in the chat. You can go and find that video. Uh, it remains one of the more popular power hours we've ever had. People love it. And there's a spreadsheet. So if you like spreadsheets, it's an absolute <laughs> knockout. Um, I think I refer to it as an excellent presentation. Lots of Excel. <laughs> One question, Irina, and yeah, most of the questions I could answer, them, and I've been doing that in the background direct to the folks, but the one that came through, France asks, where can he find, is there a, a, a software package that can help him sort of sort through ETFs and the like? So I'll give my answer. I mean, France, I use my stockbroker, and then I use ETFSA. 
those are my two sources for for the information around the different uh, uh, ETFs available, the yields, returns, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Marina, I'm not aware of a a nice all-in-one software sort of app or something like that. Or am yeah. I wrong? Yeah, so, so, so certainly not specifically just for the South African market in the, in the global market, and that does incorporate some of the South African ones, but I think the, the focus is very much international ETFs. You can look at justetfs.com. They've got quite a nice screening tool and, um, you know, sort of assessment and comparative tool and so on. I personally have not looked at it, but there's also a platform called Vetify, V-E-T-T-A-F-I, very recently, as in last week, I saw that they had released an ETF screener. So, full disclosure, I haven't tried it myself, but I'm aware of it. Um, and so, yes, I think other than that, um, it's a good point, France, and I think it's something that really we need as a South African industry need to try and work towards. Um, on ETFSA, you will find the ability to do some comparisons and certainly to search for certain criteria and so on. But yeah, not probably not, not as user friendly as we would like it to be. Yeah, no, not something nice and fancy on my phone. Bunch of folks saying, uh, how do they get hold of Narina? There's her Twitter, Narina underscore Fissa. <laughs> Head off to etfsa.coza. Their contact details are there. A couple of folks were saying, uh, uh, do you do portfolios and the like? The short answer is, yeah, there it all is. There we go. Narina V at ETFSA. Uh, if you've got <laughs> you can contact uh, Narina, uh, that's perfectly easy. Uh, and then, so, so the other question, which I answered, but I just want to double check myself on this one. The distinction between when I sell in terms of is it capital gains or income? I know that SARS says it's intent. Yeah. And and there's you know a quick rabbit hole on that. Yeah, I might buy a share yeah. with a long term view, and then I don't know something happens horrible, and I quickly sell yeah. it. But I've got different portfolios, so they sit with the same mm. broker. But I can say to size, this was bought to my long term portfolio. My average holding period is you know plus 15 years, uh, and then X happened, and you can try and prove that yeah. intent. But Nina, my understanding yeah. is otherwise the, the line in the sand is three years. Yes, it is the line in the sand. It is a grey area. Um, it depends on, you know, when and where SARS will ask questions about this. Generally speaking, also, if a, a portfolio manager or advisor did, did the trading on your behalf or sort of manages your portfolio on your behalf, they tend to be less strict in terms of the less than three years trading and more than three years capital gain. I tend to think of most of this as capital gains. I don't ever really look at the specific period because my intention in terms of how I manage portfolios for clients is that this is about long term. So where I might end up doing something in a less than three year period, it is not considered trading from my perspective because the intention is that this is portfolio repositioning or rebalancing or whatever the case might be. But it is a gray area. It is not it is not clear. Um, fortunately, you know, you need to start talking about relatively big amounts of capital gains before it's a really a massive tax implication. And so maybe if you're at that level, maybe you've got bigger problems from a tax perspective than no, whether point. it's trading or capital gain. <laughs> and, and if you are doing short-term trading with derivatives or without, do it in a separate account. It can be with the same yeah. stockbroker, but do it in a yeah. separate account. If nothing else, it makes your life easier. Um, and when, yeah. when SARS once forms, you've got like, these are different. They, they're absolutely uh, yeah. a separate in, in, in that regard. Um, bunch is coming through. Uh, we, mostly folks saying thanks. As I said, video will be on justonelap.com uh, later this evening. Uh, and there's all of Narina's contact details. Narina, always an absolute pleasure and an honor to have you on our Power Hours. Thank you very much for your time this evening. Uh, and ladies and gents, really appreciate all of your time coming through and giving up uh, an hour and some change on your Thursday evening. Thank you very much. Cheers, everyone. Cheers. All. Stay well. Look after yourself. And if you can, look after somebody else as well. Cheers, everyone.